Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambodasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambodasa Buddham Dhammam Sangham Namasami So I've rung the bell and like the bell, hopefully all of us have been trying to radiate feelings of goodwill. And although that is a, a marker of time change, people are welcome to direct your mind as is best for you. Oh, I'll give some reflections on uh, the second of the Brahma Viharas, the uh, divine abiding of compassion, Karuna. And people are welcome to continue sitting. People can change posture. You can stand, or if you're not used to sitting upright, you can just relax. You can lean up against a wall or back of your seat. Uh, but give some reflections on and what it means to uh, practice karuna. And as I'm speaking, and again throughout, not just the whole of this day long, but hopefully through the, the whole of all of our lives, remembering these two qualities of awareness, which is like the light of the sun, and loving kindness, or uh, the warmth, the, the friendliness, which uh, we express towards ourselves and towards, towards others, and the light and warmth of the sun. So, as people just sit and gather, I'm going to uh, be chanting a verse from, it's actually a Mahayana, discourse, uh, a particular mantra called the Great Compassion Mantra. And people can, uh, it is on the screen, you could try to chant along if you want, or you can just, yeah, just hear it and know that this is a, uh, it's a chant, it originally did have meaning in the original Sanskrit. Um, and is now mostly just Im imbibed, totally just filled with, uh, yeah, the energy of, of compassion. People have been chanting this for uh, millennia. Um, and just as when December rolls around, basically actually right after Thanksgiving, you know, you'll start hearing jingle bells on the radio. And similarly, when you start hearing Jenga buzz, you're like, oh yeah, Christmas, it's, it's right around the corner. Similarly, this chant has uh, the vibes, it's totally uh, imbued with this, the essence of compassion, in a sense. <coughs> so feel free to just listen or join along if you are so inclined. Namo hala danna dola ya ye namo ole Polo jedi shapolai Udi sato poye moha sato poi Moha jalo ni jaye nan sapon la fai Shudana dashe namo shi jeli doi Mongoli e polo je Shurfo la lang topo namo na la jinchu Jini moha panto sami sapo da do shu pang a shu sapo sa do namo po sa do namo po ch mo fa de do da jir to a po lo shi lu cha ti cha lo ti yi shi ni moha bu ti sa sapo sa po mo la mo la mo shi mo shi li to ying di lu ju lu jie du lu du lu fa shi ye Moha fasha ye di to la do, di li ni shur fo la ye ja la ja, 
Mo mo fa mo la mu di li hi si hi si shen Shen a ha la shan fo la shen Fa shan fa shan fo la shen Hu lu hu lu mo la hu lu hu lu si li So la so la si li si Su lu su lu bu di e bu di Bu do e bu do e mi di li Na la jing chu di li sha ni na po ye mo na sa po Si do ye sa po ha mo ha si do ye sa po Si do yi shi pa la ye sa po Na la jing chu sa po ha mo la no la sa po Si lu shang ha mo cha ye sa po Sa po mo ha ha si do ye sa po Cha ji la si do ye sa po ha po do mo je si do ye Ye sa po na la jin chi ban jie la ye sa po mo po li shang jie la ye sa po na mo ha la do na do la ye ye na mo ha li ye po lo jie sha po la ye sa po ha nan qi dian do man do la pa do ye sa po ha. So for people who don't like mantras, I apologize. Send me some compassion. Give yourself some compassion. Uh, but yeah, this is a something which has been chanted in Buddhist monasteries around the world for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, many people take it as uh, they've been practicing it Long enough, some people chant this 108 times per day. Uh, it's chanted many times in a group setting and in individual basis in Chinese Buddhist monasteries, Tibetan mon Buddhist monasteries. And um, yeah, for some people, it's almost like a radio in the background. And it's something like you can tune into whenever you want. It's almost like you can hear it in the background. It's a, a mantra practice is great because it can be just a, a default radio station in the background and anytime you you need some compassion, you can just tune into that. Oh yeah, every word in this mantra, I, I've been trying to uh, imbue that, these, these vibrations, these, this sound with uh, yeah, a well-wishing for myself and all beings. So if anybody's allergic to uh, Mahayana vibes, don't worry, go back to some Pali Canon reflections. Uh, but again, uh, and if anybody's allergic to Buddhist, um, Buddhist thoughts, that's one great thing about these, all four of these divine abidings is that there's nothing Buddhist about them. There's nothing religious about uh, a loving kindness or friendliness, about compassion, uh, having sympathetic joy or gladness when other people are happy or uh, just being equanimous and even-minded. Uh, one beautiful thing about uh, all four of these, what are called the divine abidings, the Brahma Viharas, another name for them are the uh, Apamanya Dhammas. So these are boundless mind states. Uh, another translation, an English translation, is actually mature emotions. So these are uh, mature mind states. So if we can keep these going, one of the four, if not multiple of the four going at all times, that's what a mature mind does. This is uh, someone who's like an enlightened being, basically is practicing uh, one or more of these mind states all the time. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do as well. Uh, we want to be able to tune in to whichever one of these is appropriate uh, at any one time. Uh, metta, the first one, loving kindness, is one which is, uh, in a sense, it's appropriate at all times. And the other three, uh, compassion or uh, gladness, mudita or opeka, are specifically relevant at, di at different times. So when loving kindness meets suffering, that's compassion. When loving kindness meets uh, joy, or sees other people doing well, then that's mudita, gladness, joy. And when metta 
can't really really do anything when it seems like there's uh, nowhere to go. You just can't uh, seem to radiate thoughts of goodwill either towards yourself or towards others. That's when equ equanimity, upeka, kind of comes to the fore. Um, when we first started this day long, we chanted uh, a particular verse. We actually chanted it twice. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with each of these four in turn, loving kindness, compassion, gladness, and equanimity. Likewise, the second quarter, the third, the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere. And to all, as to myself, I will abide pervading the all encompassing world with a mind imbued with these four things, abundant, exalted, immeasurable. And in the earliest discourses, uh, although there are a number of suttas where uh, loving kindness in particular is um, fleshed out how to practice that, specifically in the Karaniya Metta Sutta, the Metta Sutta, which people, many people know, the, full of, the whole of it is in uh, various mini chanting books. Uh, this chant uh, about suffusing the whole world with these, these different uh, mature emotions is some of the actually most explicit guidance you get on how to uh, practice these things. And um, yeah, again, they are uh, meditation objects, which you can take with you throughout your day. Yeah, they are especially relevant uh, when interacting with other people. So when listening and when speaking. Yeah, this is, these four are easy. It, it's easier to tap into a feeling of, of goodwill uh, than it is if, than it is, say, to uh, know the intricacies of every in and out breath while you're in a conversation with somebody, while you're speaking, while you're listening. But you can come back to a feeling of loving kindness between every word. Yeah. So as you're speaking, every space between every word, not to mention every space between every sentence, every thought, uh, you can just have this, this cloud, this... Uh, uh, emotive sense of, of well-being or compassion or gladness be there in the background, speaking or listening, even more so when you're listening. Uh, the Buddha gave four really beautiful similes for how to conceive of uh, each of these four mind states. So the first simile is about the earth. So the physical earth. Yeah, so, and these similes are, can be especially good for cultivating karuna bhavana, the cultivation of compassion, because they relate to when you're being, when you're being tested, say someone is, uh, you're having to interact with someone who's, not well, maybe who's challenging, who's challenging you. Um, whether it's someone you know, just speaking, saying their thing, and you're getting annoyed for whatever reason, or they're actively challenging you or being uh, overtly uh, aversive. You can practice like the earth. So in this simile, the way to pervade all four quarters, above and below, is to make your mind like the earth. So just as the simile goes, this is in, all four of these similes are in the simile of the saw discourse, Majjhima Nikaya number 21. Uh, the object, the idea is that just as if someone were to come with a shovel and with a basket, and we're to begin shoveling the earth. Say so you go out, the person goes out to the middle of the Sahara Desert 
and starts taking a shovel to the desert, really thinking, not just I'm going to uh, remove all the sand from this desert, but thinking I am going to make this whole earth. I'm going to dig up the whole earth and make the earth be without the earth. So no matter how much this person tries to dig, digging the sand, digging the sand, digging the earth, digging the earth, thinking, I'm gonna, I'm really gonna damage the earth. I'm going to put an end to the earth. In the same way, uh, when you make the mind as boundless as the whole earth, similarly, there's no way that anyone else's words or their actions or their speech or their mental uh, movements, there's no way that that can, that can, that can harm you uh, because the mind is expansive, it's abundant, it's exalted, it's immeasurable, just like the whole earth. So some people don't like guided meditations. Fair enough. We're gonna have some during this day long. Make your mind as vast and abundant and exalted and immeasurable like the earth. Uh, or if someone is uh, in your daily life coming to um, verbally, uh, what's called, you know, shoot you with verbal daggers, uh, make your mind like the earth. In another, another simile, uh, the Buddha says that it's like someone comes and they, they spit on the earth or they urinate on the earth or they defecate on the earth. Similarly, thinking, I'm going to defile the earth. Just that much is not going to defile the earth. The earth is vast, immense. And similarly, the mind of compassion can be boundless. So that's the first simile. So making the mind as firm and steady as the earth. The second simile is to make one's mind in all four directions, above and below, like the Ganges River. So in this simile, the Buddha says it's like someone comes with a big firebrand. So this is a big torch. You know, imagine like you see in maybe like American gladiators or like the Olympic torch. Somebody comes with this Olympic torch, which obviously has got some kind of very potent uh, oil or some very potent um, flammable uh, liquid inside of it and they come with this torch and they're thinking I'm going to make the Ganges River I'm going to I'm going to set it on fire and this is back in the day when the Ganges River was not polluted so there's no chance I mean there's no it's not contaminated by lots of oil it's possible today that someone could set the Ganges River on fire but um, at the time of the Buddha it's just cool immense flowing water and you take a little a little torch you put it in the water it's just gonna go out immediately. Uh, and similarly, if you make your mind in every direction, in front, in back, on the left side, on the right side, above and below, make it as cool and as expansive as the Ganges River or whatever clean mountain flowing, moving, alive and vibrant stream. There's no way that uh, someone can ruin your day, basically. Somebody might think, oh yeah, I'm, you know, there really are bad actors in the world. In your daily life, people will, will test you, yeah? Um, and there are those type of people who are malevolent actors who are really trying to rile you up. And then there are just the people who are unskilled and they just don't know how they are leaking out their own uh, immature mind states. Um, and with both of these, these characters, um, and with our own, you know, when uh, our own thoughts of, of harming or self-harm or other harm, our own aversive mind states come up, still, that can be just one voice in the mind, this, God, I, I hate this, I hate that guy, I hate that, I hate that woman. Um, I really don't want them to be well. That's just one tiny voice in a mind state when you can tap into it, that is abundant, exalted, and measurable like the Ganges River. So the third simile, so we've covered the earth element, we've covered the water element. The next simile is like empty space. 
And here the Buddha says, it's like someone comes with a set of, of paint. They've got a whole uh, artist supply, a whole little artist suitcase full of different colored oil-based paints. And they've got many different um, brushes. Yeah, it's a huge brush. You get the biggest brush they can. And they think, I am going to paint the sky. I'm going to just totally, it's like, say if you don't like, say this person doesn't like um, uh, graffiti and they're, they're trying to um, not beautify uh, the space with their graffiti, they're trying to uh, totally uh, def you know, deface empty space with their graffiti, just whatever kind of slur they're gonna spray or they're gonna paint on the, on the empty space. Is it gonna work? No, it's not. Uh, empty space is boundless, abundant, exalted, immeasurable. Uh, it finds no footing. The, the particles of, of paint, the spray paint or the oil-based paint, it just doesn't stick, it just falls to the ground. And similarly, if we can make our minds as expansive and spacious as the sky, 360 degrees in front, behind, sides, above, below, empty space, bright light, then no one else's words when they come to defame us, when they come to deface, uh, deface us, it just finds no footing. When the little voice inside starts screaming, you're nobody, you can't do anything, you can't do anything right, you know, just totally trying to ruin our day. That's just one little voice. This is just little uh, aerosol particles that just, if the mind is expansive and bright like the sky, then um, it finds no, no footing. And you can just shift into that perspective. Uh, if our own mind is in a place, if it's in a, a tiny place, uh, if we're feeling rather cat, rather um, constricted, then yeah, it can seem like the only thing we can pay attention to, we're totally fixated on the right, what's right in front of us, the loudest voices in our head that are saying, yeah, but he's a jerk and she's a jerk and I'm a jerk and all these other things. That's one little voice, but then shift out. You can really just do that when you train to. Boom. Yeah, like the, the director, which can just boom. Shift out, get a bigger perspective. And the final simile, which the Buddha gave, is like a cat skin bag. So I know we have some vegans in the audience. Um, so uh, you can think of some synthetic leather bag perhaps, but this is a very worn, this is a bag, yeah, you want to make your mind, which is like a very warm, uh, very worn and soft bag, a soft faux leather bag, yeah, such that if someone were to come with a, like a stick, and they were to think, I'm going to take this stick, and I'm going to rile up and make this, this bag, they're like poking the bag, yeah, they think, I'm going to make it you know, make crinkly sounds, like as, as would be the case if you just had a, uh, a paper bag, you know, you could easily just take a, a stick and make all kinds of noise with the, the paper bag. But if you have a, a thoroughly worn and uh, smooth and fully unwrinkled faux leather bag, then there's no way you just hit it with the stick and it's just, it's just totally limp. And similarly, we can make our minds just totally like this faux leather bag or like a cat skin bag. And this simile can be especially useful because in a sense, uh, you can think of your, your body, yeah? So like rather than, you know, the, it's cross-culturally the case that when people are angry, their faces uh, do similar things cross-culturally. The face gets this kind of, yeah, angry cat face, the kind of I'm ready to attack face. You get the omega sign in between the, the eyebrows. The face is just ready to ready to pounce. But you know, if if it's just a if there's no aliveness, if it's a if it's just skin, if there's just uh, yeah, there are no nerves inside of this uh, this skin. It's just skin, 
you can imagine that like your face might be crunching up, crunching up into this, be on the defensive mode, but just, oh, I can just totally relax every muscle in my face, every muscle in my body, like a human, like a human bag, like a skin bag, just, yeah. There's no longer any, any tension and any kind of defensiveness in, uh, in, in the, the musculature of the body, just relax, abundant, exalted, immeasurable. So it can be helpful when uh, <coughs> you're facing, um, yeah, voices externally or internally, which are afflictive, which are really dukkha, you know. Um, compassion is especially helpful here because uh, it's because of other people's dukkha and our own suffering, other people's suffering and our own suffering that they attack us and that we attack ourselves and that we talk badly about ourselves and we talk badly about others and they talk about us. Uh, but when we can remember these similes of the earth, uh, water, not affected, not set on fire, like empty space, which doesn't, isn't colored by other people's negative intentions or like a fully relaxed skin bag. Yeah. Then it's a very manifest, intangible, relaxing, relaxing and expanding and expansive awareness. So we can bring that, this expansiveness to our daily lives and to our meditations as uh, we talk to ourselves in meditation. So uh, in that, this talk on compassion there,